I mean, I do think that we're going to see um, significant amounts of social disruption, um, civil unrest. Uh, people are angry and with good reason. You know, I'm not asking people not to be angry. There's a kind of a righteous fury and indignation boiling under the surface. The reason that, and it's been here for a long time, been suppressed for a long time, diverted for a long time onto, you know, celebrity news and gender pronoun debates and that kind of thing. Um, but it's, it's not going away and it's getting stronger and stronger. Because of inequality, do you think, Charles? Because of what's been exposed about inequality that we're not, whilst we're superficially having the same experience on our global lockdown, there are many, many, many different types of lockdown occurring. There are many different types of threat occurring based on like our economic and social positions. And this has been sort of emphasized by this. Yeah, con- yeah. yeah. Part of it is inequality, but the anger exists even in people who are in the 1%. And I think it's coming from the inequality is part of a deeper sense of betrayal. The world was supposed to be getting better and better. We were technology and science and reason and the rule of law and democracy. All these things were supposed to capitalism, um, the, the efficiency, you know, all of these things were supposed to deliver us unto utopia. And it looked like it was working 50 years ago. Each generation was better off than the last, or so it seemed. And that has not continued. My generation is not better off, certainly not happier, certainly not healthier than my parents' generation, let alone the millennials who can't ever afford their own house anymore. Uh, People are becoming in the Western countries, in the developed so-called countries, more and more miserable more and more unhappy, even if they're in the 1%. This is the biggest myth that the system works only for the 1%. Nonsense. It doesn't work for the 1% either. If you want to find an actually happy person, you probably have to go to a village in Peru or Afghanistan or something like that. Find some hunter-gatherers somewhere. So the problem with the, with the righteous anger, the rage, the fury, is that it gets diverted onto false enemies and never exercises its true purpose, which is to flush out the root toxins, to reveal the truth. That power, the power of anger can reveal the truth. And when the truth comes into the DNA of the culture, then we begin making different decisions. So the best way to defuse the revolutionary potential of this anger would be to set up some bad guys to blame for the problems because then we can kill the bad guys or take down the bad guys without changing the system that generates new bad guys. Like I'm not actually even saying there are no conspirators, conspirators or no super powerful people, but why are they so powerful? Is it because they have superhuman powers and they can fly and teleport and read minds? Not really. They're no different than you and than, than you and me, you know. They, they depend on our agreement with them. They depend on our buy-in to certain stories of what's important, what's true, how the world works. And if we stop buying into that, they will have no power. Charles, like some of the things you said early in um, your answer there, I, I was struck by how... Uh, in terms of the rhetoric and almost actually the sort of timbre of what you're saying was comparable to a lot of um, what has become known as alt-right rhetoric, you know, like the sense of like, you are not going to own your house. Like I watched Steve Bannon, who's going to come on this show as a guest actually in over the next few weeks, addressing the Oxford Union. And I must say, it was like 30, 40 minutes before he said anything that I could disagree with. You know, outside, the, the, the no platformers were chanting, Steve, and Steve Bannon just outlined what happened after the crash in 2008, the decisions that Obama made. And it was only my sort of pre, uh, previous knowledge of what Steve Bannon's political allegiances are and the kind of political projects that he supports and indeed um, you know, creates that 
gave me a sort of a different lens other than agreement. Um, also, when you talk about like, you know, like contentment and happiness and the sort of be systemic betrayal of the narrative of progress, which I would say, you know, like for me, and I I've not done anything like the kind of research you've done feels like it's just a, a, something that's been um, increasing from agriculture through industrialization through the technological age this sort of increasing uh, aggregating aggregation of human life human beings this the, the dominion over the earth dominion over the people dominion over woman and when you said like um you know, you'd have to go to some Peruvian or Nepalese village or find a hunter-gatherer somewhere. I was struck by the... Uh, it resonated with me because of my belief that there are some universal truths, not when it comes down to how individuals might identify, live their lives, express themselves, but when it comes to the way that humanity has evolved, that for many more years than we have lived in urbanized, industrialized cultures, we lived in hunter-gatherer cultures, these are the conditions we've evolved for, this is what our nervous system is set up for, and oughtn't true progress reflect our essential conditions which seem like i'm not suggesting it's saying that there ain't brutality to a hunter gatherer lifestyle from what i've read and um, it's like you know death is part of the parcel part of parcel of it someone's sick ill old you know then we're gonna have to let them go you know there's a kind of uh, i don't know mercilessness to it but in it's in the acknowledgement of the sacred that seems to be like the sort of the wi-fi of the hunter-gatherer times, this acknowledgement that we're connected to the food we eat, we're connected to the water we drink, we're connected to one another. It seems that it is this vitality precisely that's been lost in the march of centralization, the march of material and technological advance. And it is here that we will find many of the solutions to our problems in a kind of, rev not reversion, and a, a continued evolution along the pathway, the in inverted commas, intended pathway. What do you think about that? Yeah. Yeah. So as far as what humans have evolved for, there's a big mystery there. I mean, you could say that our, that all cells evolved for single-celled uh, existence. Yet in their DNA uh, were codes that enabled multicellular existence. And I think the same is true on, a, on a, another level for human beings. Yeah, we evolved to live in hunter-gatherer bands. Yet we also have within us the capacities to live in larger collectives and live in a beautiful way. You can see the there's so many futures that are available to us. I, I invoked the image of, of standing at, at the end of a road where a hundred paths are radiating out into a hundred different futures. And we can catch a glimpse of a really beautiful future that is not a return to the past, but that resonates with things that we've seen in our lives, like the city. There's an archetype of the city that you catch a little glimpse of sometimes in London, in New York, in Tokyo, where, where there's just this ferment of cultural activity where you can find your little tribe, no matter how arcane your interests are, uh, where things are possible that are not possible. I mean, there's a certain excitement about about the city um, that draws young people to it, a place where you can redefine yourself outside of your normal reinforcing circumstances. Like there's, so there's beauty in all of the creations of civilization and technology. And I don't think that our, our, the fulfillment of our destiny would be to abandon those, those gifts. But it is also to bring back in the things that we've excluded, for example, from um, the hunter-gatherer traditional indigenous way of seeing the world. We've highly, highly developed along a certain axis of development and neglected so many other ways that human beings can develop and, 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 and marginalized those. So there's the development, I mean, for example, Australian Aborigines 
had tens of thousands of years of development of the technology of dream. Other cultures, the technology of, of psychedelic plants. Other, tech, other cultures, the technology of, of communication with beings of nature. Uh, others, the, the science of human energetics. You know, I'm looking at, at Chinese culture, for example, or India, you know. These have been relegated to the outskirts of reality in a culture that worships quantity. Because these are hard to quantify or impossible to quantify. And science says that if you can't quantify it, if you can't measure it, it's not real. So it's a matter of bringing all that's been excluded back in and socially and politically too. Like who have we excluded and pushed out and what parts of ourselves have we pushed out? Might I make a case as a kind of experiment for the idea that the things that you described about a city as being beautiful and I remember those days I remember enchantment at New York I've not been to Tokyo I tried to go and they kicked me out actually when I landed uh, London of course I've lived in London more than I've lived anywhere else and I felt that sort of allure and majesty of, of a city but could we a case be made Charles that the things that are beautiful about urbanized life are this essential displacements uh, notably the kind of worship of culture itself as a displacement of a loss of our connection to the sacred i mean popular culture is an obvious example what what is being refracted when we adore mm, Jimi hendrix or justin bieber or madonna and uh, there's a a clue in the name of the, the the third one what 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 is being projected and i wonder who benefits mostly from you know set, uh, uh, huge urbanized centralized populations what is what invisible philosophy is embedded in every brick and in a byproduct of that might be a thriving art scene but the intention is this is the best way to corral people <laughs> into industrialized conurbations so you know when i, I as as you said you know, there are limitless potential pathways to utopias and glowing futures and imp or even just improved civilization. But is there, is there anything that can be said with certainty in this post-structuralist time? Like, for example, hey, look, this is how human beings live for 10,000 years. Why don't we, when we're setting up systems as best as possible, try to replicate them? We know that there can be no sort of uh, mandate in of particular religions or particular sexualities or particular forms of self-expression. So... It's going to require a kind of, you know, as you've suggested, massive tolerance and beyond tolerance, acceptance so, uh, 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 and uh, in inclusivity. But I, I think that that can only be achieved when we're dealing with a large, you know, perhaps a confederacy of fully autonomous groups that are self-governing as opposed to any kind of centralized governance, even if we're talking like city state as opposed to nation the more people you put together that yes of course there's these opportunities for collaboration and for uh you know coalescence but it seems that the, the the reality we're experiencing now and i know it's not just one thing or the other thing but the reality we're experiencing now is everyone's individual freedoms are somewhat inhibited and we're setting up straw man arguments and quarreling over nonsense because beneath the surface we're all being dominated by an invisible i, I would argue economic ideology uh, uh, about centralizing power, centralizing authority. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I pretty much agree with that. You know, uh, I, I think, I don't think we have to ideologically discard the possibility of having cities and things like that, but we shouldn't take uh, as inevitable a continued trend toward greater and greater urbanization or centralization. But we should ask, we should, we should put it all on the table and say, what is the right role of a city? Uh, what do we want to keep about the old normal? And what do we want to let go of? Uh, you know, maybe one thing we want to keep is, is some concentrations of population that are not happening because people's land is being taken away from them, not happening because subsidized industrial agriculture is displacing the peasants, not happening because of government policies to destroy local culture 
the imposition of global media that replaces uh, traditional storytelling, like not happening because of any of those things, but because there is actually a positive role for Mecca points, for pilgrimage points, for places where you go to have an extraordinary experience that are hosted by those who hold the city. Like it could be, we could return to that conception of a city, which is actually thousands of years old. Cities were originally built around temples. You went there on a pilgrimage. Where we could be in 5,000 years is almost impossible to imagine today.